Welcome to the PRS Journal Club Live at Plastic Surgery to Meeting 2019. Thank you all who participated in the PRS Journal Club every month. We are so proud to continue the tradition. And because of your engagement, PRS Journal Club has won several prestigious publishing awards, including Best Online Community two years in a row. We're happy to announce that PRS Journal Club podcast won an honorable mention award last year and is a finalist for Best Podcast again this year. Listen to it on iTunes, YouTube, or the PRSJournal.com website. Please stay through the end for a Q&A as we'll be raffling off a $100 Amazon Echo following the event. The PRS team will be handling out raffle tickets shortly for those of you who haven't gotten them. You can read the article in the classic pairings for free on PRSJournal.com. The session will be recorded and released as a special video and podcast on all the PRS channels. We're very lucky to have Dr. Paul Sederna with us today, and we'd like to thank Dr. Sederna for joining us for this excellent PRS Live Journal Club. Dr. Sederna is the Robert O'Neill Professor of Plastic Surgery and the Chief of Plastic Surgery in the University of Michigan. He's also a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Michigan. He specializes in the reconstruction of complex wounds, and by combining his training in general surgery, microsurgery, plastic surgery, and his background in biomedical engineering, he's able to incorporate creative and innovative solutions to improve functional restoration following devastating extremity injuries and limb amputations. Dr. Sterner is a great advocate for the journal and for plastic surgery as a whole. We're very lucky to have him with us today. So thank you, Dr. Sterner. I'd like to quickly introduce the article and we'll keep the format quite similar to the podcast where we'll briefly introduce the article and then we'll jump right in and get Dr. Sterner's thoughts. And then you're welcome to ask any questions um, please just come up to the mic, introduce yourself, and ask any questions um, on a rolling basis. Uh, and we'll hopefully keep this very didactic and very uh, informal as a discussion. So in this article, Dr. Sardurna and colleagues at the University of Michigan looked at prophylactic regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces to prevent post-amputation pain. As many of you are aware, there's around 200,000 amputations, limb amputations annually, and that number is expected to rise by 2050 to over 3 million. So it's a significant problem. Post-amputation pain, which presents as phantom limb pain or residual limb pain, which most commonly manifests as the neuroma, is a really devastating problem for several of patients that undergo limb amputations. The debilitating problem can result in pain disorders going forward, as well as medication, uh, chronic medication use, such as opiate use. So strategies to really improve post-amputation pain are critical to our specialty and to the population as a whole. One of the strategies explained in this paper is prophylactic regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces, or RPNI for short. Simply explained, the RPNI strategy involves transection or a clean transection of a nerve in the limb, followed by implantation of that nerve into a free non-vascularized muscle graft, which is typically around three to four centimeters by 1.5 centimeters by half a centimeter. And then the nerve is wrapped around with the RPNI, uh, with the interface of non-vascularized muscle. And this is done for all major limb nerves. So in this study, Dr. Sturman and colleagues looked at data from 2013 to 2017 using their amputation database and compared controls to patients who underwent RPNI treatment. In the controls, they had traditional treatments for uh, the nerves, which include traction, neurectomy, suture ligation, implantation into bone or muscle, uh, strategies that we're all probably aware of. And then the other arm underwent the RPNI treatment group. They were matched on sex as well as site of amputation, upper or lower extremity, as those are known factors that can impact post-amputation pain. They compared 45 patients in each group, and the ultimate results demonstrated significant benefits when using the RPNI strategy. 13% of control patients had post-amputation aroma pain, compared to 0% of patients in the RPNI group. Even more concerning is that 90% of patients in the traditional cohort, uh, sorry, 91% of patients in the traditional cohort had phantom limb pain compared to only 50% in the RPNI group. Across several of the metrics, RPNI proved to be superior. One of the other benefits that the authors noted uh, was in time of uh, length of stay after uh, these procedures and the difference between those. In the limitations, Dr. Stern and colleagues do describe some of the limitations of the retrospective design as well as the differences between the technique and who's performing it. Overall, though, this is an excellent paper and really promising introduction to a 
strategy that's simple to execute and hopefully has a lot of promise for a very challenging subset of patients. Uh, so it's very exciting to be able to read this article and to see the data get out there uh, from Dr. Stoderner's group. With that said, I think we'll jump right in. I'll have a seat, and then if anybody has questions on this, we'll probably get it started uh, up here and start asking Dr. Severe questions. But if you can think of any questions that you'd like to ask, just please come up and ask away, okay? Raj, I think you did a good job uh, kind of uh, summarizing the article. And Dr. Sterner, I just kind of want to get your thoughts initially of kind of what is the role now in the future of RPNIs versus TMR versus the um, kind of uh, bioprostheses that are kind of starting to come out? What do you think the role is for that? And how is we as plastic surgeons should push uh, the envelope in that regard? Yeah, so thanks for that question. So I think the biggest thing is when we think of amputations, it has been decades, if not a century, since we've actually changed the way that amputations are performed. And we think of all the bad outcomes following amputations, we think of all the pain they have, neuroma pain and phantom pain and things that prevent them from establishing any kind of function following their amputations. It's a huge problem. So as we're thinking of modernizing the way we do amputations, we have to think about managing pain, phantom pain and neuroma pain, and we have to think about ways that we can enhance and improve function. So when we think of that, when we're talking about regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces, as we see in this paper, we have an opportunity, if we do RPNIs at the time of amputation, of eliminating neuroma pain and dramatically reducing phantom pain, which will give them a much better opportunity to be able to get up even in a base, very basic prosthetic. But then the work that we've done in relation to interfacing the RPNI with electronics to allow people to use their nerves to control a prosthetic device has actually allowed us to give a patient with a transhumeral amputation individual finger control of a prosthetic hand. So now, not only are we controlling pain, but we're giving them added function. Targeted muscle re is a technique which has been very effective in treating neuroma pain and phantom pain as well. The biggest concept is, is when you take a nerve and you implant a nerve into a denervated muscle, you're actually giving that nerve something to do. And so if we don't give the nerve something to do, all it tries to do is sprout, elongate, regenerate, and you get this ball of nerve that just hurts. If you give it a denervated target, it will re that target. It will get biologic signals back, which will get it to stop sprouting and stop that from happening. So that's why TMR and RPNI both can effectively reduce phantom pain and neuroma pain because both provide denervated muscle targets. There are a lot of people that have buried nerves into muscles. And that is a technique we all learn. You cut that nerve, you bury it in a muscle, and it'll be fine. The reality is, is that's completely different than RPNIs. Because when you take a nerve and you bury it into a muscle, that muscle is already innervated. There are no targets for reinnervation because the muscle is already innervated. So the only positive impact you're getting by burying that nerve into a muscle is you're actually hiding the end of that nerve under some padding, and it's probably being traumatized a little bit less. But when we take an RPNI, that entire muscle is denervated, and every muscle fiber is a potential source for reinnervation. And because of that, we can shut that sprouting down, whereas just burying it in a muscle doesn't do that. So a lot of places, plastic surgeons aren't involved at all in amputations. Um, how do you suggest we go about getting people on board? Like you mentioned, we haven't this amputations haven't really changed in, in years. How do we? come in to the general surgeon, the vascular surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon and say, hey, I got this new technique. Can I do your amputations? Can I be with you? How do you suggest we go about that? So there's a couple of strategies. So first of all, if you just want to help manage their nerves and manage their pain, you can approach all the doctors doing amputations, general surgeons, vascular surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, all of these people doing amputations. And you can say, please, when you're doing these cases, I will free up my schedule. I will be there. Let me take care of their nerves. They will do better. And as soon as they see a couple of patients, they will have you there every single time. When we started doing RPNIs, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to manage the entire limb. And so we told all the surgeons in the hospital that I would be happy to do all amputations in the hospital. I will just take everyone's amputations. And I can guarantee you, every orthopedic surgeon in the place is like, all yours, <laughs> all yours. The vascular surgeons, not as much. The general surgeons, all yours. Mm -hmm. um, and I will tell you, we did a lot. 
going forward, I, I can't imagine a better surgeon than a plastic surgeon to do the amputations. Mm -hmm. First of all, they're great amputations. For a junior level resident, they're a great operation. For a medical student, the anatomy is amazing, mm -hmm. a lot to learn, and there's nobody better to manage the soft tissues. If you don't do an appropriate myodesis, the limb isn't positioned properly. If you haven't rotated appropriate flaps, it doesn't have the right padding in the right locations. If you have somebody that has an old amputation that needs to be revised, there are things that we can do like fat grafting that limb. There are flaps we can do to save length. There's all sorts of things we can do that none of those other surgeons can do. So really having the plastic surgeons being involved in that process actually from front end to back end is probably the best, mm -hmm. but at the very least, at least managing their nerves. Mm -hmm. How do you go about, uh, it's a great way to get the surgeons involved. What about insurance companies? How do you go about getting into pre-op? How do you kind of code for these? I mean, that's a new uh, technology essentially that you're using, a new technique. How do you uh, explain this to the insurance companies? Yeah, so from the insurance companies, what we've done is we've collected all the research that we've done. Mm -hmm. And we have made this whole packet that has all our papers we've written of everything, and we just give that to them. We have not actually had it denied by any of the insurance companies. And so there's not a single code for it because it's too new. So for us, the RPNI is what we're doing is if we cut, if we're treating an existing neuroma and we cut a neuroma out, we excise a neuroma, there's a CPT code for that. Insurance companies pay for that every time. There's a code 64787, which is implant nerve into muscle or bone. We're implanting nerve into a muscle. They pay for that every single time. And then we're using a free skeletal muscle graft. It's not a muscle flap, but it's a graft. There's a code 20926, which is uh, uh, the same code we use for fat grafting. It's a free soft tissue graft, and we use 20926. And so we've never had any of those denied. When you first start doing this, are there any uh, patients that we should be weary of doing it if we get the, the patient who needs an amputation, or should we do it in all patients? What would you suggest? So if we're gonna do it at the time of amputation, mm -hmm. I would say that the only patient I wouldn't do it in is somebody who we're doing a guillotine amputation on because they have an infected distal extremity and we're gonna do a formal amputation later on them somebody who's really sick, who you're just doing an amputation to get some bad limb off, mm -hmm. and they're not healthy, um, so that patient population, but otherwise, everyone else, everyone else we do it on. When you look at the operative time in the paper, overall, for the control patients getting their amputations, the total time was 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. For us, it was 150 minutes when we're doing an amputation along with their RPNIs. That's two and a half hours, that's not too bad under anesthesia. So unless somebody is really, really, really sick, mm -hmm. or their lifespan is a month or two beyond when the amputation is happening, I think they all should get it. Gotcha. Are there any, or what nerves do you specifically target for a, a BK versus an AK versus if it's an upper extremity amputation? So when we started doing BKs, I decided we were just gonna do the three major nerves. We're gonna do superficial perineal nerve, deep perineal nerve, and tibial. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that, it worked great, and then I had a number of patients come back with sural neuromas and saphenous neuromas. And at the time, I didn't think we actually needed to do them, they're small nerves, but I should have known because we know from sural nerve harvesting that people get neuromas, and up to 20% of people after a sural nerve harvest can get a neuroma. So we should have done it from the start. So now we're doing all five at the time, and it makes sense, and we're not seeing them come back for a BK. For an AK, we're doing sciatic. Now, because the sciatic is so huge, there's so many axons there. If we put that small piece of skeletal muscle over the entire sciatic, there's not enough targets for re and there'll be a lot of unaccounted for axons. And if we have a lot of unaccounted for axons, we can potentially get another neuroma. So I divide the sciatic up into three or four branches, fascicles, just incise the epineurium, spread it out, and then wrap, do an RPNI on each of those. Mm -hmm. So I do sciatic, usually three or four RPNIs on that, saphenous, sural. Gotcha. All right. Congratulations, Dr. Stern, on a great paper, and thanks for being with yeah, us. Yeah, thank today. you. Um, RS Leaving, one of the residents at NYU. Could you just uh, briefly touch upon uh, kind of your thought process on RPNI versus TMR? I know they do have different indications, and also in the forearm. 
when you're dealing kind of with uh, nerve size mismatches for your TMRs, do you go inside? Do you prefer just to go and co op the distal stump and then suture some of the rest of that to the muscle? And how do you kind of go about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and I will tell you, that's the thing that everyone wonders. So anyone who's done TMR knows what happens in TMR. You take a big nerve and you put it into a little nerve. The challenge for me as, some, as a person who operates on nerves and also a neurophysiologist is, if I have unaccounted axons, they're gonna do bad things, period. I would never get an injured nerve and repair it and have one nerve this big and one this big and go, yep, that's good enough, I'm done. I would never decide that's okay. So, and you can imagine if you have TMR and you have an, a nerve with 10,000 axons, you're plugging into a motor branch with 1,000 axons, there are only 1,000 of these axons that can get down there. That means there will be 9,000 unaccounted for axons. And there is never going to be any significant amount of extra endonerial axonal regeneration, which means that they're not going to find their way to the muscle. So your potential is for a neuroma and continuity. So what Ian Valerio is doing, which is very smart, is he's doing TMR and he's leveraging the benefits of TMR and he's taking RP and I and he's wrapping it around the rest to try to occupy the rest of the unoccupied axons makes sense to me. Now, I can't argue with the TMR data. The TMR data is pretty good. My understanding of nerve physiology is not entirely in line with the results they're getting, but the results they're getting are good. So there might be a thing that maybe there's enough of those thousand axons getting downstream that there's enough feedback from that that it's shutting down some of those pain mechanisms. I don't know exactly, but the reality is, is it always is a little unsettling taking a massive nerve and plug it into a little one and say, yep, that should be great. Yeah. But their data is good and I believe their data. Thank but that's, that's also why then I prefer RP9 because I feel far more confident that I'm giving every one of them a lot of targets. Thank you. Yep, thanks. How do you go about uh, patients who have um, like a delayed, that you're getting them a delayed, where they have a stump neuroma already? Is there any contraindications for doing rp to that? And then what about, uh, is there any age uh, contraindications for patients with rp whether it's a delayed versus an acute amputation? Yeah, so for the very first group of patients we started doing rp on, they were all patients with neuromas. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure if it was gonna work for neuroma, even though we had no demonstration of a neuroma in our animal models. So I decided I would only take those patients who failed everything else. Mm -hmm. So all the patients who had already had e all the medications, they've had biofeedback, work hardening, desensitization, mirror box therapy, injections, stimulators, dorsal column stimulators, surgery, everything. Mm -hmm. And I did them. Mm -hmm. And of that group, we were very successful in treating neuromas and phantom pain was dramatically less. But once in a while, those patients would come back and I go, how are you doing? And they go, I feel the same. And I go, okay, but you walked in on your prosthesis and pre-op you told me you couldn't wear your prosthesis because you hurt so bad. How much are you in your prosthesis? And they say eight hours a day. And I go, so you're better. And they go, no, 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 my pain's the same. And then I go, how much are you sleeping at night? And they'll say, oh, I'm sleeping six, seven hours a night. And I go, well, pre-op you told me that you couldn't sleep for more than 15, 20 minutes at a time and you'd wake up with pain. And they go, I know I'm sleeping more, but the pain's the same. And the reason I tell that story is, is that you have to be careful understanding who the patients are pre-op and who you're gonna help. Mm -hmm. So the thing I know for sure is if they have a neuroma, mm -hmm. and I am confident they have a neuroma, I am confident I can successfully treat their neuroma. But there are lots of other things that give residual limb pain. They have heterotopic ossification, they have osteophytes, they have bursa, mm -hmm. they have all sorts of other things that give them pain. Some, some people have complex regional pain syndromes. There's a lot of things that give them pain that we can't fix with this operation. But if you select the patients properly, you can make them better. Mm -hmm. So what I do is the, a lot of times the medical student or, or a resident would go in to see if someone has pain and they're there for pain and they tap and tap and someone jumps off the wall jumps off the ceiling, they go, yeah, they got a horrible neuroma. And then I come in the room and I just start talking to them and I just grab their leg and I'm just holding their leg and I'm massaging their leg and I'm pushing around where nothing hurts. And I'm pushing, like secretly pushing over the, the nerves that are supposed to hurt and everything and they're not reacting at all. Mm -hmm. That person, I'm not sure I can help them. Then I get an ultrasound and I'll do an ultrasound guided injection if there's a neuroma there. And if that helps them, then maybe then maybe they're a candidate. So because there's so many things that contribute to pain, I think you have to be careful. Mm -hmm.
and you'll be effective in those that I think have a true neuroma that responds to an injection and they have that point tenderness in that spot. Perfect. Gotcha. Yeah. Very interesting work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank I'm you. I'm Michael from Cleveland. Um, with your physiology background, can you explain your thoughts about the sensory component of the mixed nerve and what is, where is it going in the muscle? What's, what is it doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so you know, a couple things. First of all, in muscle, there's a whole bunch of sensory end organs. There's Golgi tendon organs, there's spindles, and there's intrafusal spindles. So there's a lot of sensory end organs in a muscle that will be re by a sensory nerve. So that's one. Two is, from the work based on Jamie Bain's work from sensory babysitting, people used to use sensory nerves to babysit a muscle while you wait for motor re of that muscle. And the neurotrophic support that that nerve provided that muscle came that kept that muscle healthy, and that muscle was better when it was ultimately re -innervated. And they showed in those studies, those are from the 90s, that the sensory nerve would just grow into the muscle and then it would just sit in there and it would provide this neurotrophic support to the muscle and be happy. We in our lab have done sural nerve, RPNIs. Sural is about 98% sensory. And you can see it, we've done eye disco staining where we subtract out all the cellular elements of the muscle and we leave only the nerves and you can just see that nerve just growing into the muscle and just stopping. And it just settles it right down. Yeah. One of the questions I wanted to ask you, Dr. Sederna, is going forward, how do you design studies that can show a clear benefit to your technique compared to controls, but also compared to some of the other advanced techniques people are doing now, such as TMR or you know the graft nowhere or, or any of the variety of techniques that people are proposing? And then how do we, one, design those studies, but also then two, disseminate the information to the people who are doing the amputations if we necessarily can't be there to do them all the time, at, which is probably true to most of the community centers. Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a great question. So the first thing I wanna say is all of these new techniques are a million times better than anything we were doing before. So, so first of all, I, I mean, do we need the studies? You bet. But am I so happy that we're doing so much better now than we were years ago? Absolutely. So really, this is a perfect role for a multi-center clinical trial. And, but to make it a really good trial, you can't have like just the RPNI surgeons doing the RPNI part, and just the TMR people doing the TMR part, and just the nerve graft to nowhere people doing that. You really need, it'd be nice to have people that do all three, none of whom have any ownership of anything. They're just doing it, and they're all filling out the exact same questionnaires in a prospective fashion, and each patient gets randomized to one of those three approaches, and the surgeon doesn't get selected based on technique. It's merely a randomization of technique for it. Um, my guess is, well, I don't know how it would do, but I'd, I would love to see the study. I think it would be great, but overall, if we take any of those and we compare them to traditional approaches, all of these TMR, RP, and I dominate them substantially better. My name's Casey, I'm a resident at the Ohio State University. Um, I have a sort of two-part question. When you see patients preoperatively, how do you counsel them about what their expected benefits would be for this? And then, as a caveat to that, I think both TMR and RP and I were both initially developed for prosthetic use, and then all of these pain benefits have been discovered after the fact. So how much do you focus on the pain benefits when you're counseling these patients versus their expected future prosthetic benefits as well? Yeah, great. So. Um... So the first question is, wait. Just how do you talk to them? How do you talk to them? So when I first started doing it, I told everyone the exact same thing. I've done a thousand rats, I've done a couple of monkeys, this thing works great, I have no idea if it's gonna work in a human. I don't think it's gonna hurt you. Um, I think it's very unlikely, you know, but I think there's a really good chance based on a bunch of literature that it will help you. The concepts are good, the thought is good, and we have good experimental evidence, but you don't have to do it. And I told the first 40 people, I go, I don't know if this is gonna help you. And they all said, okay, let's do it. So then we did it. So that's how I counsel them. Now I don't anymore. Now I give them the numbers. I give them the papers and I give them the numbers of everything we know, because we have now papers for, in the, for the treatment group, patient papers for the prophylactic group. So they get real information now, but early on they got me just telling them as honestly as I possibly could, I have no idea, never done it, not sure. And the one people, particularly the number one through five, are really proud of the fact, yeah, I was one of the first ones, now they're doing it all the time. 
Um, as far as neuroma control and prosthetic control, uh, Jim Leonard is the person from physical medicine rehabilitation that ran our amputation clinic forever. And he kept saying early on, I know you want to control prosthetics, and I know that's really exciting to you, but why don't you just do it to treat neuromas? There's millions of people worldwide that will never get a fancy prosthetic but still have horrible neuroma pain. Why don't you do that for the millions of people like that? And then along the way, you know, as we get better prosthetics, cheaper prosthetics, lighter prosthetics, prosthetics with better functionality, we'll have more and more of those opportunities. Um, so we are working in both places now. I am most excited about the fact that I now have two patients with implantable electrodes that can do this with their prosthetic hand. And actually with the computer avatar hand, they have intrinsic hand function. And there's not even a prosthetic that can do that. And so that I'm excited about. We're still years away from somebody being able to go to a store, buy that prosthetic, take it home, put it on, and wear it all day long. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. One more question, Dr. Serna. Um, you know, as, as you know, post-operative physical therapy, occupational therapy is so important in these patients. Have you or do you change those protocols with regards to RAP, starting range of motion, um, working with your therapist when you're doing RPNIs or TMR? Yeah, no, nothing has changed at all. Um, and if I did RPNIs, I wouldn't let them get up in a prosthesis at six weeks. And the rest of it, I let their prosthetist do everything. They know way better than me what's best for the patients. And if they have any questions, we have a great dialogue. It's an amazing team. They send me pictures. They send me notes. They say, what do you think? And we talk. Otherwise, they control all the steps. They control all the process. With our eyes, it's exactly the same. I don't change anything other than because most of the time, the muscle I use is vastus lateralis because it's a big, huge muscle. They don't know it's gone. I can make a little incision, get all the muscle I need. They wear a wrap there for a week or something till the swelling goes away. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the question was, if you didn't hear it, was are the majority of the RPNI cases we're doing now, are they at the time of amputation or are we using it for the purposes of treating existing painful neuromas? When we started, they were all painful neuromas and they were only those people that failed everything. And then when we saw that we were helping that most difficult group, then we went to just treating neuroma patients and we convinced the neurosurgeons to stop doing high ligations and we would take all those patients and they were happy to give them up. And so then we started doing them for neuromas. Now, I believe at the time of amputation, every patient should have an advanced intervention on their nerve. I, I mean, I am not kidding, it, it is a game changer. These patients are just different. They feel great, they get out of the hospital faster they're up, I mean, it's amazing, they do great. So, so they all should be getting it. And, and it's incumbent upon us to getting the word out. So how do we get the word out? So we're doing our best to get to as many meetings as possible with people that do this. So we're talking at prosthetic meetings, like the hangar group, um, and trying to make sure that all the prosthetists in America know about this. And they go to their surgeon saying, why aren't you doing this? We're going to orthopedic surgery groups, trying to tell the orthopedic surgeons that this is gonna make a difference for their patients. We now have our vascular surgery team on board. We're doing it on a bunch of vascular surgery patients, and they're now writing papers in their journals and speaking about it at their meetings. I'm going to a, a neurology meeting in three weeks, and I'm gonna spend a day there, and I'm gonna give two talks on this stuff so that the neurologists, when they see neuromas, can talk to people going about the neuromas, trying to get at it from every single angle to make sure we get these patients the help they need. And for us, that's not business for us, but I think it's, it's so dramatic, the improvement, that people need to know about it. And it's hard to get that information out. And when the information is sitting in, a, in our white journal, our white journal is amazing, but I'm not sure how many orthopedic surgeons are gonna see it in there unless they do a specialty Google search on neuroma or something and the papers come up. And so we have to do our best to get it out in every meeting, all the journals, everywhere as much as possible. 
What's your post-operative pain control plan? Is it are they on uh, you know pregabalin, gabapentin, any kind of nerve blockers or opioids? Is it just like standard uh, until they're healed or surgery site or? Yeah, so so it's really it's highly variable depending on what they were on before. So the people mm -hmm. with neuroma pain, a lot of them are on a bunch of neurotin. They're on mm -hmm. Elevil. They're on narcotics. Mm -hmm. So we don't change a lot of that early on because there'll be a lot of changes just in them centrally mm -hmm. from making those changes. So we get them through the acute phase of the healing and then we slowly start backing off on all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The goal, I mean, nationwide we're doing so much to try to reduce opioid utilization. Mm -hmm. And with this as a strategy to eliminate pain or reduce pain, if we can get rid of opioids that people are taking too, this would be such a huge win. And so many of these people with phantom pain and aroma pain become dependent upon their opioids. Yeah. So we keep them on this stuff early on through the acute phases of healing, and then we back off. Awesome. Great. Awesome. I wanted to just ask one last question, Dr. Sedern, and then we'll wrap it up and do the raffle. Uh, this paper specifically talks about major limb amputations in the upper and lower extremity, but I know something that your group has talked about is also digital amputations. And so how do you find that RPNI fits into that world where, you know, at several institutions to do a lot of hand surgery and a lot of amputations, we're doing a ton of digital amputations, sometimes in the ER, but sometimes in the OR. So how does this technique fit in and do you see the role for that going forward in TMAs and digital amputations and things like that? Yep. So, so thanks for that. That's a great question. I got to tell you that for someone that did a lot of hand surgery and saw lots of amputations, I saw lots of patients with digital neuromas. Anyone that does it sees a bunch of them. We are now in Michigan, we're doing RPNIs on all of those. And um, we're taking it right up in the palm and we're just dunking the little piece of muscle. We're using a smaller piece for the major limb. It's three to four centimeters long, 1.5 centimeters wide, five millimeters thick for these. We make them real small, 10 millimeters long. We don't need that many targets. We don't need that many muscle fibers. So 10 millimeters long, about six millimeters wide, two, three millimeters thick, and then we just wrap the ends of the, the digital nerves, tuck it in the palm, and it actually is doing great. So we have a paper that is gonna be coming up relatively soon talking Wonderful. about that. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.